We will now open the scriptures and uh, continue reading where we left off this morning. So please open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we will start reading in verse 21. The focus this afternoon will be on uh, Hannah's song that starts in chapter 2, verse 1. But we will start reading in verse 21 of chapter 1, 1 Samuel. And there we read the word of the Lord as follows. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bowls, one ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. And therefore I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshipped the Lord there. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn ex is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him, is ac by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So far we read the word of God. Congregation in the Lord Jesus Christ, in Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, Hannah sings a song of victory. For years she has suffered under the scorn and ridicule of Peninnah, her rival wife. She had been the despised childless woman, and her adversary Peninnah had been the proud mother who looked down on her. But now she is vindicated. Her son Samuel asked of the Lord, made her a mother, and her shame had been lifted. In her song, Hannah sings about a wrong that was put right. The Lord had done this through a mighty miracle. And so Hannah gives praise where praise is due. She sings a song of victory about the Lord who is righteous and who is our holy judge. And so as we study Hannah's song, uh, we'll have the following theme. This is praise to the holy judge. Praise to the holy judge. And we will roughly follow the order of this song and see three aspects. First, uh, the first I summarize is holy reverence. 
The second is just reversal. And third, royal redemption. So holy reverence, just reversal, and royal redemption. What Hannah sings is clearly a song of praise, a hymn or a psalm. You can tell that from the language, from the poetry, right? Um, it is well known that in the Bible, poetry usually consists of saying the same thing twice in different words, parallelisms, and that is certainly going on here in this song. What Hannah is singing is a hymn or a psalm. But it also says at the beginning of the chapter, and Hannah prayed. You see, prayer comes in many forms, and with prayers of praise, it is only natural to sing out loud and to sing in this exalted tone of, of the poetry, of, of hymns, of psalms. And how different is this prayer of Hannah from the prayer she prayed in chapter 1, verse 11. Hannah's song is a prayer indeed. It's not about herself so much. And that's typical for prayer. It's not about ourselves so much. It's about the Lord. Hannah addresses him. She sings about him. And when she, even when she speaks about herself, it is still all about him. Hannah exclaims in verse 1, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My strength is in the Lord. In the rivalry between Peninnah and herself, she scored a big point, and she's kind of boasting about it. She's happy with it. She says, I'm smiling at my enemies. But the point is not her victory over Peninnah. What matters is that the Lord is victorious. She says, because I rejoice in your salvation. I rejoice in the salvation, or you can also translate the victory of the Lord. Because the miraculous birth of Samuel puts on display the grace and the justice and the mighty works of God himself. And that, brothers and sisters, is the proper attitude of the thankful believer. There's much here for us to learn so that our prayer, too, may become more, more joyful and that our joy may become more prayerful. When we experience good things in our lives, how do we speak about it? What are the first words out of our mouths? My hard work finally paid off. I can't believe we are so lucky. That's how we often talk. Hannah teaches us something important. When she focuses all her joy on the Lord who gave it to her. Here we see the heart of worship. It is joyful submission and recognizing that the good things that we receive from the Lord are His acts of salvation, speak of His victory over evil, over futility. And that therefore... We ought to give thanks to him for it, always and first and foremost. It is this humble appreciation of God and his work that propels the rest of the song. In verse 2, we get a powerful confession that God is holy, unique, strong, and faithful. No one is holy like the Lord. For there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Everything that happened in Hannah's life, everything that happens to anyone, in fact, is the result of these attributes of God. So let's unpack that a little bit. The Lord is, first of all, the Holy One. And that means that He is greater and higher than anyone or anything else. God's perfection makes him absolutely unique. And the Lord is a rock, says Hannah, a common picture in the Bible. He is a rock. He is unchangeable. He's firm and strong, unmoving. You can rely on him. You can build on him. It is a great compliment if we can say of someone, he will never let you down. 
It's wonderful if people say that about you, right? We can definitely say this about the Lord. It is never absolutely true for people, but it is absolutely true for the Lord. There is no rock like him. Now, one aspect of God's holiness is that he is perfectly just. Hannah had experienced this justice in her vindication over against Penina. It had been all so wrong, right? We talked about it this morning. Penina with all her children, bullying, childless Hannah, nothing that could be done to stop her. The Lord had turned it around and he had made everything right. He takes what is topsy-turvy and puts it straight. And that is what justice is all about. God is just. That is, he is the champion for everything and everyone that is right. And he opposes all that is wrong. And so in verse 3, Hannah praises God for this justice. And if you meditate a bit on verse 3 and what follows, you, you find there are three parts to this justice of God that I mentioned. First of all, God knows. God knows right and wrong. The Lord is the God of knowledge. He can therefore make perfect judgments. Whether wickedness is committed openly or hidden, God knows enough to judge it. And by the way, whether good works are done openly or hidden doesn't matter to him either, right? That's why Jesus teaches, if you're going to do good works, if you're going to give alms, if you're going to pray, if you're going uh, to fast, don't make a show of it. The Lord sees in the hidden place, in your private room. Second, the Lord weighs actions, says Hannah. That means he can make a perfect assessment of right and wrong. God is never at a loss deciding about justice. He doesn't hesitate as human judges may do at times. And third, and that is shown in verses 4 and following, the Lord actively meets out justice. He act actively distributes justice. He takes care of the wicked and he helps the innocent. God is a God of perfect justice. And now what does that mean for us, for people who live under the rule of this just God? Hannah gives us very simple advice in verse 3. Do not be proud or arrogant. Gloating about wickedness, as Penina had done in, in the Elkanah household, is foolishness in the light of God's justice. You won't get away with it, you know, because the uniquely holy God is faithful and just, and he will put right whatever is wrong, no matter how well we hide it. And that brings us to the middle part of Hannah's prayer. What does God's justice look like in practice? In Hannah's own life, the end of her childlessness was enough to right most of the wrong that was done to her. At the end of verse 5, Hannah um, kind of mentions her own situation and she engages in what I think is poetical exaggeration. She says, um, the barren woman has born seven children. Hannah had one at the time. More would follow later, but she didn't know that yet. And then she continues, she who has many children has become feeble. Well, I don't know that Penina was feeble at this time. But God's justice has a tendency to do this, though. Generally speaking, when God distributes his justice, the wicked oppressor, the top dog, sinks very low. And the underdog, the oppressed, is brought upward toward glory. But Hannah is not narrowly looking about her own situation. This is not about her. She sees God's holy justice at work on a much larger scale, everywhere in the world, in fact. And she lists many examples. Holiness and justice shine here in many different colors, and they stand out beautifully 
in the surrounding drab narrative. Because the rivalry between the two women that the book of Samuel starts with is only the tip of an ugly iceberg. Immediately after Hannah's song, we read all about the perversion of God's sanctuary, which was an orgy of unholiness and injustice and of bullying of God's people in their very acts of worship. And so Hannah does not have to look very far in her part of the world to see all kinds of wickedness and all kinds of need for divine justice. And so her song is one great confession that the Lord will indeed take care of all, it, of, all of it, all these different forms of injustice the Lord will set right because he is holy, because he is the judge. Now some people read Hannah's song as a manifest for social revolution. They latch on to the descriptions of power and poverty in this song, and they say, look, the Bible wants us to equalize all power and to redistribute wealth. And it's very easy, once you start seeing that here, to say, hey, the Bible is a little bit Marxist. Isn't that fun? But that kind of reading overlooks the obvious context of Hannah's prayer. All the reversals mentioned here, revolutions, if you will, are expressions of God's justice and of God dealing with actual evil. The mighty men in verse 4 are not just anyone who has power or authority. The mighty men in verse 4 are the arrogant people who abuse their strength to oppress others. The gluttons mentioned in verse 5 are those rich people who refuse to show kindness to others, who refuse to help out those in need. Really, the principle is shown in verse 9 and verse 10 at the end of Hannah's song. What is the principle? That God protects the faithful, but he, that he silences the wicked. The Lord fights against those who oppose him. This is not first and foremost about power and wealth. This is about evil and goodness. This is about God being just. And so what then do we think of those verses about the rich and the poor, about the powerful and the weak? Well, first of all, when the Lord brings justice, he does not care about those things. As verse 9 says, not or by strength no man shall prevail. By strength no man shall prevail. It's not power that makes you win. It's not wealth. Nor is it poverty or weakness. Are you rich? Well then be careful to honor God in a faithful life of service to him. Are you poor? then be careful to honor God in a faithful life of service to him. God's law is the same for rich and poor. It is the same for people in power and people with very little influence. Second, as the Lord administers justice and brings punishment and reward, the Lord can do so and often does so by overthrowing any human strongholds the Lord can take away power and strength and he can remove wealth and influence. The Lord can also turn the least in society into a leader. He can give riches to the, poor, to the poorest of people. In fact, God has the ultimate power of ending life and giving life, as Hannah beautifully says um, in her song as well. But the Lord kills and makes a life, verse 6. And therefore, all people, no matter what, what place in society you are, no matter what economic status you have, all people, beware. There is no place for pride and arrogance. All that you have and all that you are comes from God. It is up to him to decide who keeps what and who gets what. He can give, he can take away at less than a snap of his fingers. Hannah's song 
is a song of faith. She states facts that are not yet seen. In her own life, she has experienced some of this divine justice. The birth of Samuel was for her a great sign that God is indeed there, that he is indeed just. But there is still much injustice in Israel, and I'm pretty sure that her rivalry with Penina wasn't solved completely either. So Hannah's song of praise is still awaiting fulfillment. But believing Hannah looks at the future with eyes of faith. Surely the Lord will put an end to all evil and will vindicate all his faithful ones. You just wait. He will do this. If it's not tomorrow, it is next year. Don't we often find ourselves in a similar situation? Especially if you confess the Lord, it's easy to become an underdog in society. And as the times go on, it seems it becomes easier and easier to become ostracized and stigmatized and uh, discriminated against if you try to be faithful. People scorn, people bully. We may run into people who have lives that seem so much better, and they can be proud and arrogant about it. I, I don't serve the Lord, but look, I have a nice house, and you, you say you're a believer. Where's your God? What's he doing for you? Never mind that, Hannah reminds us. Never mind that, because all of this can change. All of this will change when the Lord reveals his justice. At the end of the day, it is only the faithful ones of the Lord who will receive honor and life and glory. And that is the point of verse 9. The Lord will guard the feet of his saints, the feet of his faithful ones. But the wicked shall be silent in darkness. And so Hannah leads us in a prayer of praise to the one holy judge of heaven and earth. He is the God who will protect his people, who will make an end to all the injustice that they have to suffer. But there's one set of lines that we have to look at yet. It's the end of Hannah's song. She answers her psalm, her prayer, in a most remarkable way. Hannah sings of a king anointed by the Lord. In verse 10, this king will be instrumental in bringing the justice of God to his people. Why is this remarkable? Because Hannah lived in a country without king. There was no king in Israel, the book of Judges concluded. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Even the priests did what was right in their own eyes rather than in God, God's eyes. No king, no prophet, and the anointed high priest, Eli, did nothing to bring holiness and justice back. But Hannah sings of an anointed king. With prophetic insight, Hannah believes that God will bring a savior king to his people. The victorious salvation of the Lord that she mentioned in verse 1, will come by means of a specially chosen man. I don't know how much of this Hannah really understood. That's always the question when you read those prophecies. They wrote these things. They didn't see them yet. What did they understand of it? But here's one clue. Hannah sings this song as she is leaving Samuel behind at a tabernacle. Just imagine that. You've waited so long for a child, and then finally the Lord gives him to you, and you raise this, this child with all the love you have for three years or so, until he's old enough not to be nursed anymore. And then you bring him to the tabernacle, and you leave him behind. And you see him once a year. She will be losing her son, and it's going to be painful. But Hannah rejoices 
She does not sing this song when Samuel is born. She sings this song when she leaves him behind at the sanctuary. And she leaves her song in this dysfunctional sanctuary. If you haven't done so yet, just read on in the chapter, a dysfunctional sanctuary. Do you want to leave your toddler there? But Hannah does it in faith, and she sings a triumphant psalm. Did she understand that her son would become a great prophet and a judge, that he would restore order and worship in Israel? Did she have an inkling that Samuel would anoint two kings, Saul and David, to rule God's people in his name? Hannah, did you know? But more importantly, brothers and sisters, do you know? Do you know how the Lord fulfilled Hannah's prophecy here? Do you see the victory of God's salvation brought into the world by his anointed king? Samuel was to usher in a beginning of that, especially in the person of King David, whom he anointed. But we living in the dispensation of grace, we see Jesus, who is the heavenly king over a kingdom of peace. Jesus, who taught that the first will be last as a rule of the kingdom. Jesus who taught that the kingdom is given to the poor in spirit and that those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness will be satisfied. Jesus who gave life to those who had descended into the grave, as Hannah said in verse 6. Jesus Christ, anointed king, Savior of his people. He is the fulfillment of this song. This is where Hannah's song not only ends, but finds its completion. Last week on Easter, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that is where the church truly rejoices in God's salvation. And so may the Lord give us all to see what Hannah saw from afar. Not only the beginnings of God's kingdom and justice in our lives now, not only even the beginnings of God's justice and kingdom in our country or a restoration of that, that too, may we see that too. But may we especially see the heavenly reality of a holy king who turns all of earth's wrongs into right. And if that is your hope, brother and sister, then you can sing Hannah's song a victorious psalm to the one holy God and his anointed king, even in the challenges of everyday life. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we truly rejoice in you and in your salvation, knowing, Lord, that whatever happens to us, whatever unfairness we experience, whether it is in small things, maybe in the schoolyard, or big things in our jobs and in our relationships, that you will set things right. We thank you, Lord, for the assurance of your justice so that as Christians we can suffer whatever we are, we are given to suffer, that we do not have to fend for ourselves, but you fend for us being a perfectly just God. We pray, Lord, that you, that you keep us from pride and arrogance, that you keep us from oppressing others, Give us the fear of your judgment, but also the comfort that you are with all those who serve you, that you will always protect your saints. Lord, we thank you for the King, for our Lord Jesus Christ. May we be faithful citizens of his kingdom and give him all the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.